We are trying to track what exactly was on the heart of God that led God to create me, to create you, to create the birds. The Bible says one of the things that was on, are you, are you following? One of the things that was upon God's heart was that God wanted children. He did not just want children that were vagabonds, but children that were like Jesus. So his adoption process to make us his children took place through the efforts of Jesus, took place through the sacrifice of Jesus. It's on the strength of what Jesus did that God now has right as father over us. Are you there? And the Bible is saying that God's effort to make us his bona fide children is consistent with the good pleasure of his will. So when we talk about the will of God, what we are saying, we are talking about something that was already resolved, that this is the way God wants to achieve his program. The will of God is more ancient than creation. The will of God is in keeping with the counsel of God. God took counsel in himself, and is on the strength of the counsel that he took in himself, that he came up with what his will is. And part of what we discern that his will is in this scripture is that God wants children that will express him. That was the desire that was upon the heart of God. Are you there? So if God now achieves his will, which is that you and I become such children that are in keeping with his original expectation, then that desire that God sustained will now be actualized through our imagines. In all of this explanation that I've made, if you are following me adequately, you will discover that one of the motivations for God or the motivation that God had to create in the first place was because he had a desire in his heart that he was willing to satisfy. And the desire was that he wanted children. So if I now manifest upon the face of the earth, and meanwhile, his desire is not utopian, it is, it is with specifications. The kind of children he's talking about is the children after the order of Jesus. Those, type, those like look and operate like Jesus. So if I show up and I'm not quite like Jesus, that desire that God had to, for children has not yet been satisfied in me. Are you there? You are not there. That desire has not yet been satisfied. So the reason for which I was created has not yet been satisfied in the heart of God. God is still supplying me oxygen. He's still supplying me provisions. He's still sustaining me because he has hope that that his desire will come to pass. And the person that fulfilled that desire for which God himself testified was Jesus. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is the idea that I have about man. Notice that last phrase, in whom I am well pleased. The pleasing dimension is in keeping with the fulfillment of the desire that God had before he set out to create in the first place. Are you with me? So the objective of my living today should be to please God. And if that is the objective, we cannot avoid studying the life of Jesus. Because in Jesus, God was satisfied. In Jesus, the desire was fulfilled. So we need to look at Jesus. And as we begin this series, you will be amazed how different, how so different you are from Jesus. I, and I know you think you're a good Christian, yeah. You, <laughs> stay with me, stay with me. Now, it, it's possible for you to um, rejoice quickly because you pray in tongues for five hours and you move in the power of the Holy Spirit the witches in your neighborhood have come to obey and to recognize the authority that you carry. And uh, you have quite some medals on your uniform. 
But you see, unfortunately, God is not hoping to have different kinds of children. He wants to have one type. And he told us the type that will please him. That type are children that are in conformity with the very image of that man called Jesus. Is that clear? So if you forget everything, forget, don't forget that it is only one man, one type of man God will accept. You see, I bank with Zenith Bank, and I'm not, bank, and I'm not uh, marketing. I bank with uh, one of my, one of the banks I bank with. Okay, I think Access Bank also does that. Yeah, Access Bank also. So I also bank with Access Bank. So just in case you think I'm marketing, we have two options. Now, when you take my ATM card, Zenith Bank ATM card, and you visit the Zenith Bank ATM machine, not another bank, just Zenith, Zenith for Zenith, and you slot it in because I send you with my pin to go get me some money. The machine will recognize the person slotting in the card as me. It, the machine doesn't recognize you. The machine only recognizes me, right? And then, so it will, the machine will greet you. It, the machine will, my name will be there. Say, welcome, then it will put my name. Even though it is Friday that is slotting in the card, the machine will address you as me. You there? In order for you to be able to transact with my card, you'll be addressed. He sees you as me. That's why we pray with the name of Jesus. Have you sat down to analyze the implication of in Jesus' name? What's, what's the meaning of that? Oh, you're not, you're not following. You're not trying to think. I, you see, to understand the ways of God, your mind must be deployed adequately. When I pray and I say, I pray in Jesus' name, I'd like us to see from the point of answered prayer, not from the point of the prayer. So I'm praying in Jesus' name. So the Father, that means I come as Jesus. It's just like the person coming as me using my ATM card. And the reason why the thing will work is because the machine assumes that it is me. The whole processes of, of the spirit, the divine supernatural, are designed to respond to Jesus, not to you. So you come in Jesus' name. That means you come as Jesus. And that's why the favor that follows finds expression because you are not coming in your name, but you are coming as Jesus. Why do you think Jesus has so much authority? The reason is because he is the man that is approved. The destiny of every Christian is to be conformed to the image of Christ. That means, and I'll tell you what it means when we say the image of Christ, because the Bible reveals that Christ is the image of God. So I need to tell you what the image of Christ is. Are you there? And then you will see a lot of scriptures that recommends that we should wear the same kind of mindset that Jesus wore while he walked this world. This is a critical matter. And I don't know how many weeks we have to study this. But the first thing I want to pull out of the whole arrangement is that Jesus was a personality that was willing to fulfill all righteousness. And I'm going to tell you the meaning of that. And that's why we need to move to the book of Psalms quickly. He, he, he was willing to fulfill all righteousness. In Psalms 40, Psalms 4, 0, verse 6, and seven. You see, God is not a creature of time. God is the one that created time. God created eternity. Decided to operate in eternity. Right? He's beyond eternity, but he decided to operate 
in eternity as a frame of reference in order for him to have a platform to advertise himself for him to be known. If God operates in a frameless platform, it, is impo- it will be absolutely impossible to know him. So he domiciled himself in a context that will afford us the opportunity to know him. Because one of the reasons why we're created was to explore God as astronauts explore space. Are you there? We were created to explore God. God is like a reality, open for exploration. And that's why we were equipped with the Holy Ghost of promise, because the Spirit of God searches all things. The Spirit of God can search into God, and through the utensil of the investment of the Spirit of God on your life, you can search into the deep things of God. So God is knowable, and God's effort to ensure that we know him is that he has invested in us his spirit. That's the first thing he gives you the moment you give your life to Christ. And that's an equipment from him, a gift from him that will enhance you to know him. Now, this is the book of Psalms 40, verse number 6. It reads, Sacrifice and offerings thou dost not desire. My ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. Now, this, are you there? It, it, it is, it is um, possible for us to engage in very tedious sacrifices with the hope that when we accomplish that, we will, be, we will please God. Are, are you following? There is this um, perspective of fallen humanity that we need to do something, let's do something. The way um, idols are appeased, you do something and sacrifice before the idol, and then the spirit will now say, okay, I'm no longer quarreling with you. So it is possible to carry over that perspective in our work with God. And he's saying that, I'm not actually looking for your sacrifices, for your effort to please me in that sense. When you really want to begin to please me, the first thing you need to know is that I have already written your destiny in my book. And the reason why you were born was to fulfill everything that is written in my book. So when Jesus came, he did not come to be creative. He came to fulfill what was written concerning him. You know, the objective of what we are talking about is what you can do that will please God. Because the place of man is a creature that has the capacity to please God. That's what separates man from other creatures that exist in the universe. In fact, the other creatures that exist, exist because of you. But the reason for your own existence is to make sure that perpetually you please God. And if we are going on the journey of pleasing God, we cannot... Avoid the example of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. Then Jesus said that I want to fulfill all righteousness. That was part of his orientation. That was part of the things he had in mind that made him end that place in God's assessment. He wanted to fulfill all righteousness. All right. So I took you to the book of Psalms to show you prophetically that Jesus was given a body, a human body. And the purpose for which he was given a human body was because the objective that he was coming to fulfill upon the face of the earth was already written, was already enshrined in the volume of the books. 
So part of what it means to fulfill all righteousness is to ensure that everything that was written concerning me by God, I am patient enough to see it through. And a lot of us live life without knowing, without the consciousness of the fact that your book was written before you were formed in your mother's womb. In fact, if I take you to the book of Ephesians, which I believe I need to do, you will discover that your destiny, first of all, reaches into the past before it goes into the future. And if you do not align with that which was written in the past, you have failed on the ground. I need to show you a few scriptures. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. Come with me to Ephesians. Ephesians. Chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. So his will was a mystery before this time. But in the days of the first apostles, the mystery around the will of God, around what God wants to achieve, was unveiled. It is on the strength of that unveiling that took place that the apostles of the first generation began to explain the will of God. Are you there? All right. So, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, and that his will is according to his good pleasure, which he proposed, proposed in himself. Now, the will that God wants to accomplish, before it became a will, it was first a desire in the heart of God. A desire in the heart of God that God was, God was looking out for his accomplishment. And because God wanted to accomplish that desire, he now willed it that this is what I want to achieve. First of all, he desired it. Then subsequently, he willed it that that is what he wants to achieve. And it's in keeping with his will that he provided the administrative infrastructure to accomplish that plan. Now, so if my life is going to matter to God, my life must satisfy the desire that God had in his heart initially before he willed it. You know? My life must satisfy that desire that he had in mind before it was captured in his will for me to manifest upon the face of the earth. My manifesting on the face of the earth must be with a certain knowledge. I have come to fulfill what God had in his heart before he willed that I should manifest upon the face of the earth. So my destiny, first of all, reaches into the heart of God to fully articulate what God conceived about me before I was made manifest upon the face of the earth. And that's what the psalmist was saying, that I've come to fulfill that which is written in the volume of the books. It was documented in the studio of God what God wanted to achieve with my life. And what I've come here to accomplish is to fulfill that which is written in the volume of the books. If you are here this evening, <laughs> hallelujah, you are not following me. Now, I'm a preacher of the gospel. Uh, I'm an apostle by the grace of God. And uh, maybe because of the grace the Lord has given me, <laughs> you don't know how many invitations I have in a year. If I tell you, you will not even believe it. So no need for me to tell you. How many invitations I have in three months. But you see, what determines my movement, my accepting invitation, is not because there is invitation. I have a very good idea of what God wants to accomplish through my life. It's already fully articulated, and I have explored God enough to find a little of what God wants me to accomplish. Are you there now? So what determines whether I pick an invitation or not is dependent on, on whether the goal of the invitation is designed to accomplish the things that I am sent here to deliver. There are a lot of reasons why people put meetings together. The other day, the reason why a pastor put meetings together was because he wanted to get married. So he put, are you following me? 
a program for seven days. And they were taking Isaac, the Isaac offering every night. Even the Isaac in the Bible is only one time they gave him, but <laughs> hallelujah. Isaac. So there are many, and then at the end of the day, on Saturday of the meeting, he went and got married. So on Sunday, he was a married man with Isaac. It was an Isaac policy. Now. So there are so many reasons why meetings are put together. If you don't know what, what was written about you in the volume of the books, you will not be able to fulfill all righteousness. You will spend your time in the vanity of the strategies of men. Are you there? I know why you are sober. I understand your... The reason why you are sober <laughs> might be because you, have, you are already guilty of spending your life to accomplish frivolities that are not in any way related to the original reason for which God is sustaining the oxygen that is in your life. Have you seen someone on oxygen in the hospital before? How, how much do they pay per hour? 45,000 per hour. 40, what? 4,000 per hour. So how many hours do we have in a day? Calculate for one day. That's how much? You are going quiet. You are going quiet. 96,000 per day. That's what God spends to keep you alive. If God is not sure that he can derive pleasure from your life, he will no longer spend that 96,000. That's what I'm saying. If you woke up today, Oh my God, you are not fully well. <laughs> if you woke up today, it's because God is still hopeful that he will achieve what he wrote about you in his books. That's the reason why he, was, he paid 96000 for your lungs to capture oxygen. If God doesn't want you out here, I assure you, he has skillful ways of accomplishing it. <laughs> Very skillful ways of achieving it. But if you woke up today, it means that God paid the 96,000 and he is hopeful that like Jesus, you'll be willing to fulfill all righteousness so that every item that is captured in the volume of the books concerning you will be accomplished. Now, think for a moment. I don't want to waste your time, but there are deep matters. And I need to dig deep for you to see the implication of what I'm talking about. How many of you ever attended a burial before? Then at the barrier, and you saw the person, full human being in a casket. I will never behold a dead body in a casket anymore. I think the last person I saw in that state was my dad. He was very much my dad, but he, was, he had no life in him. Now, the lesson that should be learned anytime you hear that somebody died is that. We must be diligent to fulfill what was written concerning us. Jesus, he was so desperate to fulfill what was written concerning him that he was willing to pay additional prices of submitting to someone that should be submitting to him just so that he will not miss out on any item that is captured in the volume of the book. He says, sacrifices and burnt offerings, you do not require. But what you required is a body. A body. The reason why I was given a body is so that I can be equipped enough to fulfill that which is written in the volume of the book. I have some questions for you. Because those days while we were on campus, the ladies that were more, most beautiful, they were exceptionally stubborn. The reason why it is so, it's because most of them did not find out the reason for which God gave them beauty. The moment you don't know the reason why God gives you anything, you are going to squander it in a way that is not consistent with God's intention. And then it will look as though the reason why you veered off was because of the endowment God gave you. Are, you. are you following? Now, I, I don't want to tell you stories ah, because I don't know who is listening to me. Maybe the people I want to talk about are online now. 
That is very, in fact, these days, preaching is very difficult. Are you there? If we, if we were not online, the things I would have told you people. <laughs> as young as I am, I am, uh, if I tell, I'm a bit uh, experienced. We were jumping. In fact, my lecturer called me on campus, called me and said, I heard you preaching yesterday. I agree that you are called. This person I'm talking about is not born again, no. He's not a religious person. Especially when you earn your master's or PhD in places like Germany, and it is in the sciences. They come back godless. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So he was not a religious man. So, but I guess he was after, and he, he studies every day till late in the night before he goes home. So he's that kind of guy. He heard me preaching. Ah. The next day he called me. He said, I have no doubt you have a calling. I, do you know I listened to you yesterday? You are good at what you do. But the reason why you are here is not to preach. The reason why you are here is to get this certificate. And I have the authority to give you. And I will not give you because you preach. So stop preaching. Go and read your book. When you, <laughs> when you graduate, throw the certificate away and jump on the streets and start preaching. But now, stop. stop. He shouted, stop. His counsel, I heard everything he said. But the reason why I, I even preached the more, after that day, I increased the preaching. And he was disappointed in me. He was hoping that, okay, I will work under him and then he will press for my employment. And then I will continue. There, there's a project he was working on which he had not completed. He felt I had the mental capacity to continue that project. He felt so. I don't know what it's about, but he felt I had the. Meanwhile, in terms of grades, there were people better than me in that class. Are you following? But he chose me. I said, stop. Can you just stop? The reason why I did not stop, <laughs> to, his, his, to his disappointment, he was disappointed that I did not stop. I knew God had shown me dreams of what I was supposed to accomplish on that campus and that if I fail, my future ministry is going to be affected. And I can call names of people that trivialized their campus ministry when they were on campus. Huh. That they are nowhere to be found now. So I was given instructions from the Lord to take it very seriously. And then a lecturer now came and obviously the guy likes me. And in his love for me, he did not want me to fulfill that which was written in the volume of the books. The day you say you want to fulfill all righteousness so that everything that is in the books will be fulfilled through your life, that day you will discover people that love you passionately. Those are the people that will resist you from fulfilling it. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. And the moment Jesus began to desire to fulfill everything that was written concerning him. John now told him that, I know you, because part of the, the high point of John's calling was to identify who the Messiah was. And that was why he was given the ordinance of, of baptism. That in his baptism, anyone that comes out of the water, that's written in the book of John chapter 1, and the Spirit of God should descend upon him and remain, it will be him that will baptize with fire. But before Jesus was subjected to John's baptism, John, being a prophet, was able to identify that this was the Messiah without the baptism. And he submitted to Jesus and said, you know, I'm the one that is supposed to come to you for baptism because you are higher in the ladder of the Baptists than I am. I simply baptize with water to achieve repentance, but you have other elements with which you baptize which is beyond my pay grade. You, you are designed to baptize with the Holy Ghost and you are designed to baptize with fire. So, if there is anyone that needs to be baptized of the other, you are a higher in the ladder of the Baptist. I should be, all of this analysis was going to obstruct Jesus fulfilling all righteousness. When people speak, 
when people that are desperately in love with you speak from the flesh, trying to counsel you out of fulfilling all righteousness, it is very logical. It is very sound. It is very, very cerebral. It makes sense. So if you have not seen what was written in the books, you are likely to be swayed by their sweet counsel. The first thing that you must do. Are you following? I know the services we hold here are powerful. You are blessed. Don't stop at receiving good sermons and powerful atmospheres. Take a trip into God and find out what was written concerning you. Because Jesus will undermine sound counsel just because he wants to fulfill all righteousness. Go and find out what is written concerning you. I will give you my own example as as an encouragement. Are you there? By the time I finished youth service, I went on a fasting campaign because I wanted to know what next. I knew that the school I went to, the university I went to, yes, I was supposed to go to that university. There were many options of high institutions I could go to, but I had known God before I came to this place. Are you there? I knew that he was the one that was behind it. So, and I knew that the reason why he sent me here, eventually I discovered that this is where I'll be trained as an intercessor. Are you there? So there was a little prayer group those days that I joined myself because I knew that prayer training was part of uh, the reason why God sent me to this university. So I met a great man of God, Ben Great, Ben Great. He was a prayer turbine, and I encountered him while we were on campus. He was the leader of our prayer team, and I joined myself. As we exercise ourselves in prayer, are you there? If you are in the perfect will of God, there is a system of ventilation that God makes available that ventilates your soul. Such peace that passes all understanding. If you are in the very center of the will of God, this is the first blessing that God makes available to you on a daily basis. There is this peace that floods your heart. If you are walking the path of destiny, this visitation of peace will be coming to you again and again and again and again. And for those of us that are preachers, you can finish preaching a sermon and everybody is excited and you might lose your peace in the process. People are hailing you, but you, you knew in your heart that you miss God. They don't, you don't need to come and repent to them. It's God you're offended. The moment you finish ministering that, they go back to your bedroom and lie down before him and ask him for mercy. It means that you fulfill something that was not written in the volume of the books. Now, I, I think I need to digress and show you something. Are you there? What is the implication that finds expression when someone begins to fulfill something that is not written. A good example of that is our brother Moses. And God told Moses to speak to the rock so that the rock will bring water, will produce water. And Moses did not understand the technology that God was working out. Moses was the shadow of the messianic anointing. And everything that he did was supposed to be consistent with prescription. Because it's a shadow of a reality that is to be revealed to the earth. And God instructed him clearly, and he knew it. Speak to the rock. Because the first time, he had smitten the rock by instruction. And that, that time, he smote the rock by instruction, spoke about... Jesus is suffering in a certain way. Right? So now he was supposed to speak to the rock, and Moses now got angry. Instead of speaking to the rock, he smote the rock again. I hope you know the implication of that. He has compounded the sufferings of Christ. 